Good morning, church. So we are here in an atmosphere to worship God. And to Him alone we give our praise and honor. It's such an excitement when we come in the presence of the Lord, in the atmosphere of worship and praise, to lift up the name that is above every other name. The name of Jesus. Is that that name we call in crisis, in storm? When things are not going the way we seem, we seemingly expect them to go. And sometimes we get frustrated, but God is still in the midst to bless. No matter what the situation, the circumstances are in our lives, no matter how it seems, we're here this morning to worship. And we just sang that song, but as we reminisce on the words of what we're really saying to God. We are here to worship. Every opportunity we get to worship God is an opportunity better than those that we had in time past. So every opportunity we get to worship, let us bring a worship that is exceeding what we can give. And let's dig deep into the core of our spirit and bring out worship worship that is deserving to go up to the king of kings and lord of lord we worship a great triumphant awesome 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 god so therefore we are returning awesome 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 praise to him this morning there's nowhere else we want to be this morning than in his presence there's nowhere else we want to go this morning than in his presence we just want to tell the Lord, draw us close to you. Draw me close to you. Never let me go.
Continue praising him this morning as we stay in that atmosphere. We know that we are a people who are destined for greatness. We know that we are a people who are destined to win. If you believe that this morning, say, I am destined to win. Turn to your neighbor, say, You are destined to win. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together this morning. Come on. This song. This song is for all the people with love in their hearts and love in their eyes. You don't have to worry.
Jesus is the winner, man. Jesus is the winner, man. And because of that, all victory goes to him.
lift your hands and praise the Lord. to be a Christian. Why don't you shout hallelujah? Amen. God has been good. God has been faithful. In spite of our righteousness, he's still God. Thank you. For, I, just, I just give him thanks. And this is a song that said, Kabiosi. I'm on my knees. Kabiosi. To this great God. Kabiosi. Que le 
내게 나속이맘마 이메라오 이메라 제호벤메라 So what the song is just saying is we are saying that we are worshiping you and we are telling you thank you because you are good and you are great to us. Imela Jehovah Mela Aine Kelege October 24th, I'm right here. Tickets will be made. It's a ticketed event, and tickets will be made available. Um, um, we'll get across to Mr. Sleepy. And um, any other questions you'd like to ask, um, you could get to him. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Hallelujah. We just want to give God thanks for his amazing grace. His love is unconditional. In spite of all that we have done, He still loves us and He still gives us the gift of His grace.
wonderful name somebody just worship his name this morning somebody just exalt that wonderful name this morning just open your mouth and begin to give him the worship that he deserves just open your mouth and begin to give him the praise that he deserves because he was the word at the beginning he still is the word in the present and he still will be the word at the end there was nothing that was made without him the word his name is beautiful. Just worship him this morning. You are the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high.
that he came to earth because of me and you. The Bible says, and there was a voice in heaven, and the Lord said, whom shall I send? And Jesus Christ decided to come down. He became flesh. He took upon ourselves our sins. He took upon himself our curse. And he went down into the grave. The devil thought that he had won the battle over him. The first day he was in the grave. The second day he was in the grave. But on the third day he arose. But on the third day he arose in victory. Somebody bless the name of the Lamb. Somebody bless the name. turn to the word of God. Haggai 
chapter 1. Let us stand. I also want to encourage the parents again. Whenever your child begins to act up, I want to encourage you to help us by giving, or giving her a little walk so that they can settle down and then get back in when they are quite settled. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. We don't have a lot of reading to do this morning, but I want us to pull up the scripture. Haggai and chapter 1. And we're going to begin at verse 12, please. And everybody reading together. Everybody reading together. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the word of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, so the people feared the Lord. Verse 13, Haggai, the Lord's messenger, remember that, delivered the Lord's message, remember that, to the people. I am with you, the Lord's declaration. Last one, the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the spirit of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. They began work on the house of Yahweh, their God. This is the word of God. Please have your seats. And so, we come to the opening. In fact, last week, as we looked at Blessing Sunday, many of you were anticipating that this is where we would be. And we are talking here about reigniting the fire, the causes of spiritual awakening. This is a message, the core content derived from, I keep mentioning this, Robert Robb, Scottish preacher. God, I think, inspired him to exegete the very short book of Haggai, two chapters. For five weeks now, we have been in chapter one. Chapter one has 14, 13, 14, I think, verses, or thereabout. And we are not through with that yet. There's a lot there that we have to pay attention to that we don't need to rush off on. Because the matter of spiritual awakening is principal, and the matter of spiritual awakening is core to God's people. We have seen the spiritual apathy, what the confirmation is, what the causes uh, of spiritual apathy are. And we have seen the consequences on individuals and God's people of spiritual apathy. Y'all pay attention. Wake up. Pay attention. This is for purposes of all reason. Which is why I say every church member needs to get every one of these messages. So as we shift now to the message about spiritual awakening and what really brings spiritual awakening. And, and within, the context of, within the context of Haggai, there, there are three things. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I'm going to limit it and say only three things can bring spiritual awakening. But within the context that we are dealing with, within the context where God's people were fired up and then lost their steam and seemed to be dragging their feet. The whole place seemed cold, 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 cold. Within that context, we saw the signs of spiritual awakening and three particular things that caused the spiritual awakening. Now, in the first case, is the bold delivery 
of God's message. The bold delivery of God's message. Something was very much lacking up to this moment. If you were here from day one when we started this message, this series, we said that the people came out a little bit early out of Babylon and came back to Jerusalem and came back under the leadership of the priest called Ezra. And Ezra, being priest, was able to do priestly things with the people. Get their attention focused on temple. That's what priests do. Get their attention focused on ceremony, which is what priests do. Get their attention focused on the, the correctness of the procedures. That's what priests do. But something was missing there. Though there was need, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. Though there was need for priests, though there was need for propriety, though there was need for correctness, though there was need for order, though there was need for dotting the I's and crossing the T's and making sure that the right things were being done, something within that was missing that was needed to ignite their fire. And we begin to see it here. When we read verse number 12, and be prepared to go back and forth with scripture because um, on, on the overhead, because I want you to be able to see the scripture. That the word came to Haggai and he delivered God's message. The word came to God's messenger, the verse is, and he was able to deliver God's message. If there is going to be spiritual awakening, there must be the bold delivery of the message of God, of the word of God. The prophet Haggai, as he came, and we look at his message, he delivered what God said to him. He delivered a correct message. We have to be very careful that our message is correct. Not a preaching that is without substance. Not a preaching that is based on the whims and the fancies of man. And not a preaching and not a preach word that is intended to scratch your ear and to placate you and to make you feel comfortable. That kind of preaching never ignites, never lights a fire. There has to be the, the appetite for correct preaching. You ought not to be afraid of correct teaching. If you want your fire lit, you have to be willing to embrace correct teaching. What correct teaching does is that it, and it, it is not man, it is not the teaching of man. What correct teaching does, what correct preaching does, what the bold message does is that it simply comes from God, the one who concocts the message, through his conduit, the messenger, to the people to receive the message. Hear me and hear me well. Because this message originates not with the messenger, because this message originates from God, the core content of the message would contain at a proper and correct diagnosis of the people's condition. It is not the messenger who sees you. It is not the messenger who understands. It is not the messenger who has an appropriation of what is going on in your life. It is up to God. I'm telling you, it is up to God to see your life. To see in the life of his people. And to come to a correct diagnosis, which he is God, he knows. And to give that diagnosis 
and said to his messenger, speak to this business or speak to that matter or speak to this issue. It is not that the messenger wants to grind on your toe. It is not that the messenger wants to rain on your parade. It is not that the messenger wants to get into the commerce of your life. So when the messenger begins to call out, when the messenger begins to call out sin, when the messenger begins to call out attitudes, and when the messenger begins to call out habits, and when the messenger begins to call out correct behavior, it is a message that comes not from the messenger. It is a message that comes from God. The messenger has a task. The messenger has to correctly say in his message what God says to him. What God says to him concerning the unfaithfulness of the people. What God says to him concerning the selfish attitude of the people. The messenger has to say it. The messenger has to say what God says to him concerning the apathy and the aloofness of the people. The messenger has to say it. The messenger has to say it when he sees people loving themselves more than they love God, the messenger has to say it. The messenger has to say, when God sees and God says, listen, you are lukewarm, the messenger has to say it. It may come across as being um, an accusation, but the messenger has to boldly say. The messenger like Haggai has to call out the, well, let me go ahead and say what Haggai called out, the ungratefulness of the people. The messenger has to say it. I know that it is that people don't like preaching that hits too close to home. But in Haggai's day, there was one thing that started this whole thing going. It was that Haggai was no Ezra. Haggai was a bold prophet. And while priests like Ezra are concerned about the order of service, follow me? While priests like Ezra are concerned about the elements of the service, prophets like Haggai have to stand and say, Thus saith the Lord. And every now and again, there is a place for a man of God who hears the word of God to say to his people, thus saith the Lord. So Haggai's message was a correct message. But Haggai's message was also a confrontational, was also a confrontational message. It demanded, therefore, that the people do something. It was confronted them. It was confronting them with where they are and said, go and do something about it. The messenger, therefore, not only has to preach. Any messenger that stands before God's people and being used as an instrument of spiritual awakening has not only to preach a correct message, but he also must, he also must have the courage to be confrontational. To require an ask of the people, having heard the word of God, what are you doing about it? In the book of James, in chapter 1, 20 to 25. But it's an interesting, uh, 20 to 22, you can read a little bit more than that. It's an interesting metaphor of people coming before a mirror. Coming before a mirror and seeing everything that they should change about themselves. And then leaving the mirror and not making any changes. There is a futility there is a sense of, uh, permit me to say idleness.
of wasting time. If we hear a correct message, but we do nothing about it. If there is a message that challenges your lifestyle, if there is a message that challenges your commitment, do something about it. If there is a message that challenges your giving, do something about it. If there is a message that challenges, a correct message, mind you, a correct message, a correct message, that speaks about your entertainment, do something about it. If there is a message that speaks about your worship and it hits you and it's correct, do something about it. If there's a message that speaks to your desire for fellowship with the brethren and you are not fellowshipping enough and the message hits you, do something about it. And so in verse 8, pull up verse 8 of chapter 1 please. It will get up there at some point, but it says, listen, what you've got to do, there it is, go, there it is, go up into the hills, leave what you're doing, go up into the hills, bring down lumber and build a house, then I will be pleased with it, says the Lord God. He says a little bit more, I'll get there in a while. He says a little bit more, but he calls them. This is the prophet saying to the people, take action. Too many people come to the house of God and they are stirred but not moved. Too many people. A fire cannot be lit or sustained. And even as I was preparing this message, it, it occurs to me. I don't know how many, and you don't have to be a pyromaniac, but I don't know how many of you have dealt with fire. There's a point in which when you're trying to light a fire, you're trying to light a fire, you have to do a lot of fanning. You know that, don't you? But there's a, a point of, of time, a point in time when the fire has caught. Oh, look at you people. What does gas stove do to you? What does electric stove do to you? There, I mean, you don't know even, some people don't even know what a coal pot looks like. Never got sent to light coals. Let me tell you something, you put all kind of oil and cloth and whatever gasoline um, coal starter and try to light the coal. And you fan and you blow. Yeah. You fan and you blow. You go. You don't know. Some, it takes effort. You know, you're trying to light a fire. It takes some effort. But I tell you this. For, for one who has lit some fires before. I tell you this. Once that fire is lit. Boy, you could stand off. In fact, you might have to take out pieces of coal out the thing. Before the thing will burn up the old bread fruit. Once a fire is lit, it keeps going. Once a fire is lit. It has a self-sustaining momentum and energy. It seems to be creating its own energy. Once a fire is lit. Once a fire is lit, you don't have to force it to keep burning. Fire burns. It's a given. And so Haggai, in preaching the correct message and the confrontational message, says, Listen, you want your fire lit, you've got to do something. He was confronting them. He was saying... Leave what you are doing and go do something different. It was also a controversial message, to be sure. Not a feel-good kind of message. As we have gone through all of the conditions of their apathy, he exposed to them what they were doing wrong. He exposed to them that their lifestyle was materialistic. He exposed to them that their love for God had run cold. He exposed to them that they weren't worshipping God like they used to worship before. He exposed to them that their priority was not God. What I found with correct preaching, what I found with correct preaching is that because it is the word of God, it hits home and people get it, people get it. But the gap between thought, cognition, and action, simply because there is, how do I say this, a lack of volition of the people, a lack of will of people to do and to put into practice what they know to be the truth. 
And so you can have correct prison till the cows come home. And it makes not a difference with the people. And so what Haggai did is that he knew his message was not really rubbing where the people want to be rubbed, but he preached it anyway and called them out. It was controversial. It was controversial. Messages were hitting too close to home. They were very pointed messages. He was ruffling feathers, but it was a bold delivery of the word of God. My friends and members of this church, you all pray for this. Pray that the preaching, whether it is myself or anyone that stands here in the pulpit to preach the word of God, pray that the preaching is bold, that it is correct, it will confront what needs to be confronted, and it will call people to action. But the second thing that I notice here that brings us that brings us to spiritual awakening and it is it is very instructive to me as a preacher that having said all I said there about correctness of preaching about boldness of preaching that you could have had all of the best preaching in the world and there was not going to be spiritual revival and spiritual awakening without this next thing and it was this it was the stirring of the spirit of god i've often said to my leaders and i've often said wherever i've preached or given um, seminars uh, that that don't overestimate the value of preaching you could have the best preachers in the world you could have the best preachers in the world but not necessarily get the best results in the world. Something is more important. Let the Holy Spirit instruct you with this. Something is more important than just the preaching of the word of God. The preaching of God must be accompanied by the stirring of the spirit of God. It is God who serves the heart of his people in our message this morning in our reading this morning it was very clear that it says god stirred the heart of jehazadak god stirred the heart of jerubbabel zerubbabel and god stirred the heart of the people look at it again in fact look pull up verse 14 pull up verse 14 let's look at it Here it is. The Lord stirred up the spirit. The Lord stirred up the spirit. The spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. The spirit of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehazadak. And the spirit of all of the remnant of the people. Oh, that God will stir our spirit. It is one thing to appropriate a correct word. And I believe that the word that is preached Sunday after Sunday is the correct word. But it is one thing to have the correct word, but oh, the futility, oh, the futility of the correct word when the people are not responsive to the stirring of the Spirit of God. The simple truth is this. Some people, when they hear, you all get this. Some people, when they hear God's truth, react and, and some people, when even when the conviction of the Holy Spirit is there, react by hardening their hearts in disobedience.
disobedience to the Holy Spirit hardens the heart. Please pull up for me Zechariah chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 11 and 12. Please pull that up. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 11 and 12. I want to show you all something here. It is not only something from the past. It is something that is contemporary. Zechariah. I just want you to see this. These are people who hear the word of God. These are people who have correct teaching. These are people who see revealed to them their condition every week. As if somebody went and told somebody your business. The correctness, the unpointness of the word of God. Diagnosing, cutting asunder and addressing. Not that the person knows your business. But addressing core issues with you. And the Holy Spirit connecting with you while the word is being preached. The Holy Spirit connecting with your heart and saying, boy, that is you. Been in this business for 30 years plus. I know this. I know there is this thing that goes beyond the preached word. I know this. I know that there is this thing called conviction of the spirit. I know it. I know that the word of God says the Holy Spirit shall come and convict you. So I know it. I know people come under conviction. But when people come under conviction, it can happen. Listen to this. They can refuse to pay attention. This is in the word of God. And they can turn a stubborn shoulder. Sometimes when the, when the preaching is rubbing your sweet spot. Sometimes when the preaching is right on your toes. You squirm. But you do nothing. You, do you think for a minute it is for lack of correct preaching? Do you think for a minute that spiritual apathy is for a lack of the moving of God's spirit among his people? Of course God moves. No fire can be lit. None. When I mix all of the triggers and stimuli of bold preaching, of stirring of the spirit, there is this contingent and this condition among the people. Where we have people who hear correct message and where we have people who are under the stirring of the spirit, but when the message and the spirit brings conviction to their issues, to what's happening in their life, to what they know is right, that there is a stubbornness, a dogged stubbornness, a determination to continue doing what they're doing anyway. And you tell me that doesn't happen. And I just show you the word of God that says, yes, it happens. Yes, it happens that men and women know that the word of God is time. God is warning you about your condition and where you are and what's going on. Because God wants to really light your fire. But what's happening there? You're refusing to pay attention. Sometimes it's bodies when you fiddle. If something could distract you, you're glad for it. You're ready for him to move on from that point. Quick, move on and move on. Why are you stuck there? I'm going to stick there because the Holy Spirit tell me, stay there. Close up your ears. <laughs> you could close. Let me tell you something. In over in the New Testament, when it really bothered them when Stephen preached the word, but they, they closed their ears, they screamed, they tried to drown him out. And when they couldn't get the boy to stop, they stoned him to death. Just making sure there are no stones there, right? It is necessary. 
It is necessary to have the bold preaching that is confrontational. It is necessary to have the bold preaching that diagnoses correctly. It is, there, it is necessary to have the bold preaching that will provoke you to action. It is necessary, but it's not enough. It is necessary, but it is not enough. It is necessary if we want spiritual awakening to have the moving of the Holy Spirit to stir up the, the, the Sheltiel and to stir up the Jehazada and to, to, to stir up the Jehoshaphat and to stir up the people. It is necessary to have all of that. But it's not enough. Are, are we feeling this? Are we getting this? Are we getting this? Good, 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 good. People turn their ears away. People turn their heart. It is not for lack of conviction that people are living the way they live. It is not for lack of confrontation that people are living the way they live. What more do you want for God himself to come down and deal with you? Let me, let me tell you exactly what I have written here in my notes. No preacher, no preacher can break hardened people. That's what I have written there. No preacher, don't care who, you could bring them in from all over. No preacher can break hardened people. I reference. John 16 and 8 for my second point that says God's spirit alone can break a hardened heart. God's spirit alone can break a hardened heart. And there are some people who seem impervious to the moves of the Holy Spirit. John 16 and 8 you pull it up and I will read it. You pull it up and I will read it. Most of you know this. For yourself, it is straight from the word of God. Let the word of God confront you. John 16 it says, when he comes, meaning whom? The Holy Spirit. Let's say that again. When he comes, meaning whom? The Holy Spirit. Now, if the Holy Spirit does come, and if the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit does reside in your heart, when he is there, this is what he's going to do. He is going to convict you about sin. He's going to convict you about righteousness and he's going to convict you about judgment, coming judgment. Any purported, any child of God, therefore, that truly has a spirit within them has a, 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 an almost automatic GPS to keep them on the right path. When I'm in, in the States and I like to drive, I... I do thousands of miles. I just love the Texas highways and the Georgia highways I drive from. But I try these days to drive with a GPS. And I like to go places. I like to check out my map on my route and say, this is what, every now and again, a road that's on there would be closed off. And as I drive onto that road, the road you, the, the, there's, I don't want to, sometimes I, you ask them, I turn it off. I turn it off. I'm like, I want to go where I want to go. That's why I end up lost sometimes. Because this is in, um, that I'm on the wrong track. It's telling me I'm going in the wrong direction. And then it ha and it's a female voice. And you know, men don't like female voice telling them that they're wrong. Somebody say amen. This is the truth. If you're going to tell a man around he wrong, get a male voice. Siri, I don't know. I don't have a problem with you, Siri, but you know what I'm saying? So I have this female voice and I hate it all the time. And those of you who have traveled with me, you know it's true. All you hear is recalibrating. <laughs> Recalibrated. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. I know where I'm going at least. I like to think so until I end up lost. The Holy Spirit is that internal voice. And the way that I treat my GPS, some of us want to treat the Holy Spirit like that. When the Holy Spirit says, boy, you're going wrong. Girl, you're going wrong. It's like, uh, turn that off. Turn that down. Turn that down. Turn that down. Turn that down. But the Holy Spirit is there. To cut. It's not the pastor's job. It's not the council's job. You say, oh, pastor, you didn't speak to that. Or the council didn't, and you didn't, eat, you didn't 
beat on that issue. It's not our job to point out every wrong in your life. Somebody say amen because I don't want to go crazy. It is the Holy Spirit's job. Even when there's bold preaching of the truth of God, it is the Holy Spirit job to come into your life the bible says and to convict the brother and let him know about the past they know about this sin but i know so let me tell you somebody say amen and the, the pastor the pastor and the, the church they don't know but you know because the holy spirit is bringing conviction of sin righteousness and judgment only god's spirit alone can do that so in the midst of the bold preaching of the word of God, which came with Haggai, there was also this, the stirring of the spirit. The spirit stirred up the prophet, and the spirit stirred up the priest, and the spirit stirred up the people. It is my prayer, and spend a lot of time praying this morning, it is my prayer that even right now, beneath your quiet demeanor that the Holy Spirit is stirring you up and that the Holy Spirit is convicting where there is sin he is convicting of that and where there's matters of righteousness he's convicting of that and when there is a matter of you are dark to the judgment you don't know what's coming down in your life that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of that too that's what brings revival when the word of God is preached and when the Holy Spirit is stirring and people are embracing of that stirring. But there's one more thing and then I'm done. There's one more thing. What lights the fire? What lights the fire? The bold preaching of the word of God. The stirring of the spirit of God. But one more thing lights the fire and it is this. And, and it's funny because you say, Pastor, that's powerful stuff. The bold preaching of the word of God. If that can't light your fire, what then? The stirring of the Holy Spirit, Pastor. If that can't light your fire, what then? And it is this. It's simple. It's simple. It's simple. Get this, eh? You can have bold preaching all day, all night. Mm -mm. You can have the Holy Spirit stirring. People will be stirred, but not moved. Mm -mm. So there's one more thing. It's not the preacher. Somebody say amen. It's not the Holy Spirit. Somebody say. Ouch. So if it is not the preacher. And if it is not the Holy Spirit. Then who is it? And the answer is. Having your fire lit. Having your fire lit. The good preaching is good. The stirring of the Holy Spirit, we can't get it done without the stirring of the Holy Spirit. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it boils down. If, if your fire gets lit, you had something to do with it. And if your fire is not lit, you have something to do with it. Because the third element, you could bring coals. And you could bring oil or gas. But somehow, at some point, you have to bring matches. Have to bring matches. And so the third point, the deliberate, this is the match right there. The deliberate contemplation of our actions. If you want Go back now to Haggai chapter 1, and we're going to do verse 5 and verse 7. Haggai chapter 1, we're going to do verse 5 and 7. Now watch this. Straight from the word of God, watch this. Now the Lord of hosts says this. Everybody say this with me. Everybody say this with me. Think carefully about your ways. Let, let's go that again. Now the Lord of the host says this. Okay, I want to get everybody, everybody involved. One more time. Now the Lord of the host says this. Verse 7. Verse 7. Uh, verse 5. Uh, did we go up to verse 5? Let's go up to verse 5. Sorry. Verse 5. Same thing though. Verse 5 says the same thing. Oh. Well, well they, they both say the same thing. I just wanted you to see it twice. 
same thing. In psychology, um, we call it the aha moment, the moment of realization, the moment where you get it. The purpose of the preaching, the bold word of God, the purpose of the stirring of the Holy Spirit cannot be complete without personal contemplation. You see it over and over and over again. In the life of the Apostle Paul, Saul as he was, he was confronted on his road to Damascus. The Spirit stirred him. But then when it was all said and done, he needed three days to go and sit with Ananias and to contemplate and to think seriously about his ways. Being on fire with, for God is not a matter of, as we say, skylarking. Living the life of obedience is not a flippant matter. And at some point, At some point, we have to begin to think about God's standard and what God says and what God wants. Now, this, this is what we call for a lot of honesty. And then we have to think about our ways, what we're doing, how we are living, and see if there's any congruence between our ways and God's ways. And often when we think carefully about, and often when we think carefully about our ways, it is when we see for ourselves where the divergence is between what God wants and what we want. So thinking carefully about our ways will require a sense of seriousness, but also will require a sense of honesty. I like it that he says, go to the mountains. I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure I saw that in the reading. I'm not, sure that, I'm not sure that I saw that, but this is one of the verses. He says, go up to the mountains. Now, that metaphor, and he, 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 he tells them to come back down. He tells them to come back down and bring lumber and build a house. But it begins with going up to the mountain. Get back to that pinnacle. Get back to that meeting with God. Whenever Moses went up on that mountain and he had an experience there, he came back and it was very clear that he had been with God. Go back to the mountain people. Go back. Go back. Go back. You need to see on people's face, you need to see on people's demeanor, you need to see in people's action that they have been close to God and they are close to God. It, you could tell those who have been in the mountain and those who just live in totally in the valley. It's, it's, it's not too hard. Go back to the mountain. When the disciples had been upon the mountain with Christ, they were trans. Um, the, the, the Christ was transfigured right before their very eyes, and and the glory of the God of God shone around them. There was a change. Transfigure. There was a change. They were on the mountain. Today we call it the Mount of Transfiguration. You gotta get back. You gotta get back. It requires. Hear me say this. It requires a sense of honesty. Galatians chapter six and verse seven makes this very clear. You cannot fool God. I mean, those are almost the exact words. You can't fool God. Sir, you can't fool God. Madam, you can't fool God. None of us, we can't fool God. There needs to be honest contemplation for the fire to be lit. And this is just what the word of God is stirring in me today, mind you. That, that there needs to be honest contemplation. People need to be honest about where they are. People need to be honest about their giving. People need to be honest about their bitterness. People need to be honest about their laziness. People need to be honest about their apathy. People need to be honest about their negative spirit. 
People need to be honest about their concerns. People need to be honest about their fears. People need to be honest about the things that are bothering them. People need to be honest about their impediments. People just need to be honest. People need to be honest about their, their prioritization, whether they love God this much. People need to be honest about the level of their commitment. People need to, to sit down and ask themselves, am I really committed? Am I really loyal? These are not questions for the pastor to, to begin to ignite. And these are not things for the pastor to stir with you. These are things that you need to sit down and suss out, think out for yourself. Because who am I fooling? I have to think. Galatians 6, 7, you can't fool God. The prophet Haggai says, go up to the mountain. Go up there. Think for yourself, he says. Give careful thought to your ways. And so there's, for the spirit of awakening to be relit within God's people, there needs to be the contemplation. There needs to be the serious delivery of the word of God. There needs to be the Holy Spirit stirring, but there needs to be the contemplation on the part of the people. I close with this. That in the most powerful story ever told by Jesus Christ in some estimation, the story of the prodigal son. And that story ends well. But that story in Luke 15 premises or hinges or turns on one particular idea. The entire story, the way Jesus tells it where the book ends, he was a masterful storyteller, beginning in the house and ending in the house. But in the midst, is the, in the middle of all of this is this whole turmoil. But he brings it back to the house in the end. It's beautiful. But the hinge on which this door turns, the hinge on which the story revolves is this whole idea of personal contemplation. All of the journey was a downward spiral until it hit this point where it says he sat down in the hog pen. Sat down. And, and listen, you can have your aha moment in a hog pen. I mean, I'm not saying that go to a hog pen, but even then it is not lost if your life is a hog pen. It's the beauty of grace. Even if things is just a, an absolute total mess, you have made an absolute total mess of your life. Here is the hinge. Here is a turn moment. So he sat down. You get to verse 17 now. Well, 16 and 17. You get there. And it says that he thought to himself, he came to his senses. Personal contemplation. Sitting down and thinking, okay, you have heard the voice of the pastor, the preacher, the messenger. And you have heard the Holy Spirit stirring you. But there comes a point where you yourself have to say something to yourself. And what he, after, after the message and after the Spirit stirring, he said to himself, I will get up and I will go back home. And so, you have heard the word. <laughs> Don't deny it. You have heard the word. But it, it, it ain't that. It's not that. And the Holy Spirit, I know and I feel the Holy Spirit stirring. But it's not that. It's not that. It's not that. It is that contemplation what you say, but that was for me. I am going to give careful thoughts to my ways. And only God knows your ways right now. All of it. I don't know if it is a hog pen. It could very well be a hog pen. That ain't my business. But wherever you are and whatever you are doing, turn. Okay, are you hearing me? Clearly, wherever you are and whatever you are doing, turn. Are you hearing me? Wherever you are and whatever you are doing, Give some serious thought to your ways. Give some serious thought to your ways. Because it is only, you can have all of the Bible preaching and all of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, fling down and throw down and toss and everything. You can have all of that. 
Are you hearing me? It ain't that. Don't fool yourself. It's not that. I've been there where it, it, the whole thing moving. The Holy Spirit is moving. Boy, did you feel that the Holy Spirit move? Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit move. But did you move? Did you move? You have to get it. Some people, I said oh, over and over, people don't understand deliverance. People don't understand deliverance. People don't understand deliverance. Another message there too. Another message there. But when it comes right down to it, word could thunder. Holy Spirit could shake and move. But at the end of the day, you have to see for yourself where you are and then you make a decision to turn. That's how your fire gets lit. This fire and my people, you will not be lit. This whole series could go on. Could preach the best preaching. Could preach. No fire going to get lit over that. So I don't fool myself. Could have the Holy Spirit in this place every day. No fire going to get lit because of that. So how does your fire get lit? Your fire gets lit when you give some thinking and some thought to what's going on in your life and you're saying, I'll go, not me, I'm going back to the mountain. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah, man. I'm going back to the mountain. And when I'm coming down, I'm coming down to build the house of God. I'm coming down fired up. I'm coming down juiced up. I'm coming down happy because I have been with my Lord. My fire has been lit and I am fired up to the glory of God. Amen and amen. Oh.